How do you there guys and welcome back to Edgar TV or welcome to Edgar TV if this is your first time here. My name is Matthew Edgar. I was on the PDC Pro Tour from 2011 to 2022 with nine years as a PDC Tour card holder. And in those 11 years, I'm going to share with you some of the experiences I had playing against certain players and doing certain things in events. Today, what I'm going to look at is players that was hard to play. Now, I'm going to say players that was hard to play, not players that was hard to beat beat because obviously if that was the case I'd just go Phil Taylor, Michael Van Gerwen and I'd just reel off who are the best players in the world. That's not what this video is about. This video is about players and playing. Now it's not always down to who is the best ability. Sometimes certain things that players do just knock you out of flow or rhythm that makes it a little bit harder to deal with or harder to play your best game. That's why sometimes we have head-to-head -head records where if you look at the rankings, you go, how does that player beat him so often? Think of football. Certain people will enjoy different pitches more due to the differences of size and variations. It's exactly the same with darts. Certain people's pace or different quirks can cause different results. We can have a look at some of those players today. We're going to start off with Andrew Gildin. Now, Andrew Gildin is just a little bit tricky because sometimes you can go to throw, but it may be a little bit too soon. And that comes from a couple of little quirks he's got in his throw. Watch how he starts at the right-hand side of the hockey there and slides across to the left. Now, that just adds a little bit of processing time and a little bit more think. Let's take a look at Michael Van Gerwen here. You'll notice that Michael Van Gerwen has gone past Andrew Gildin's eye line before he is set and ready to go. Now, this is good for Andrew Gildin. This might be the reason which he does it. We see players like Gary Anderson, for example, will stand on top of the hockey whilst they're trying to get into that set position and just give that little bit more time to make sure the player has gone past. Andrew Gildin shuffles across. Now, what that will do is that will just give Michael a little bit more time to think at the back of the stage. He, Andrew Gildin won't throw a dart until Michael Van Gogh and he's standing still, essentially, in this case. Where against a lot of players, there'll be a dart, maybe even two darts in, before you get to that point where you're standing still at the back of the hockey. It then happens on the backside of his throw as well. Now, this is his practice dart, so it's not as exaggerated, but notice that little step to the side. Now, that little side step from Andrew Gildin can often be a bit misleading because what you can go to do is go to walk to the hockey. When you see him throw his last dart, you can start that movement. Now, a lot of times when I've played Andrew, I've started walking when he's thrown that last dart. There, you start walking, that step to the side just makes you check yourself and almost have to step back to step forward again. Otherwise, you're there a bit too soon and you're sort of ready to go while he's still collecting the darts. So, can be a tricky customer to play for that and the fact that he's a very good player. Keep that in mind when I'm doing this video, guys, that this is in no way a knock on any player whatsoever. It is their quirks. I'm not saying that anybody does this on purpose either before anyone tries to misquote me on that. This is just the individual quirks and characteristics that people have within their game that is a bit tricky to play against if you're the opponent. That is for us to deal with, not for them to change. I want to make that perfectly clear. I suppose as we've just talked about Michael and he's on the tip of our tongue, we might as well discuss him in our next feature. Number two, Michael Van Gogh in Mind Games. Very, very tricky to play, not just because he's so good, but he reminds you how good he is. And this brings me back to Minehead when I played him in the Players' Championships on ITV. And I had in my mind that I was going to Try and beat him on the bullseye and then give him the darts. Because I'm one of these players that prefers to throw second if I can. It's a tactic that I've employed a few times. And it, for that, it's just because I traditionally was a slow starter in games. So it would be better for me to give away the throw and then try and get that break. Rather than potentially try and defend the throw and play that first leg under extra pressure. Various people will tell you different things as to why they'd prefer to play first or second. That was mine. And I had it in my mind I was going to try and win the ball, so I won that and then give him the darts, just to make him think. And I actually won the ball after about 14 exchanges of 25s and balls. And then he said, are you going to give me the throw? For which I said, no, I'm throwing first. He sort of double bluffed me. The other thing he does quite often is if he's on a shot or you're... On the 170, a 167, a 161, he'll leave you to have a shot at it. He won't go for the ball, he'll set it up. And he did this against me in the quarterfinal in the Players' Championships at the back end of 
the previous season. And what happened is he left me on 161 and I took it. And then the very next leg, he left me on 170 and again gave me a shot at it. He refused the ball to give me a shot. And in your mind, you're thinking, you don't think I'm going to get this. And it just plays that little bit of debate with you. And then he'll go pull out an amazing shot. Phil Taylor used to do this quite a lot. Just when I was starting to get on par with Phil in a match head-to-head, he won 150, he went bull, treble 20 tops. Who starts on bull on 150 at a close part of the game? They just want you to know that they're the better player and they do it by sending the message on the board. Paul Nicholson, winner of the Players' Championship Finals that was actually at the Circus Tavern at that time, iconic venue, but very hard player to play for the reasons that we've already spoke about with Andrew Gilding. Now, we spoke about Andrew Gilding with that setback and that set position. Paul Nicholson used to do exactly the same thing. But instead of approaching the hockey and having that movement like Gilding, he would stand back until you had literally walked past the hockey point. I remember having a conversation with him about this, and he talked about how there used to be a line in which you wasn't allowed to approach and throw until your opponent had gone past. And that line went across the line of the hockey. And you always imagined that and played with that when he was playing his games. So until you got behind him, he wouldn't even throw one dart. So with that, what that did, it gave you a lot of processing time, a lot of time to sort of stand behind him. You'd end up watching what he was doing. And he was very, very regimented in his approach. And he still is now. I've shared a house with him recently, and he's one of the tidiest, most regimented, everything's got its own place sort of people. And it was the same when he was playing darts as well. The case would be opened in a certain way, in a certain place, with a certain lineup. He'd have his energy tablets down. It would literally be a whole route. And you would end up getting drawn in and watching what he was doing. And with that, made him quite hard to play. Now, I don't want to spend too long on this one because I did speak about this when I spoke recently about the slowest players to play. Um, Brendan Dolan's tricky mostly because he changes his speed to suit. If things aren't going right for him, he may start drawing faster. Or if he starts the game faster and things aren't going right, he'll change the pace by slowing it down. And that's one of the hardest things to do when you can't quite get into your own rhythm and pace and one minute you're throwing legs quite quick and then the next are quite slow. It can become quite tricky to read the pace of the game and to make sure that you can sort of be within your own process. And Brendan is very good at managing his own process, which can sometimes knock you out of yours. Ricky Evans, completely a contrast. He's so quick that it also causes a problem, which might be weird when I'm saying one time someone playing slow is an issue and then the next someone playing fast. But Ricky is that fast. By the time you've got your darts and you've walked back, he's already on the way to collect his darts. And what you end up doing is you end up getting into almost a cycle where you're almost swirling around and You almost have to find processing time. I was talking recently about too much process time. In the case of Ricky, you've got to find things to do to try and slow it down. I remember having a chat with various players about this, and a lot of people describe it as getting caught in the Ricky Evans whirlwind. Now, what that means is just circling around. It's as if there's no opponent because he's so quick. By the time you get back, it's time to throw again. And sometimes you just have to find that little bit of extra. And what a lot of people was doing was they'd just take a longer walk. So walk right to the back where the table is and then come back forward again. And again, right round and back to the table just to ensure that it wasn't collect hockey, collect hockey, collect hockey. Because then you start losing that feeling of being in a game. It's like being at home just having to practice. But you're not. You're playing a serious game for serious prize money. When we talk about longevity, you have to put Richie Bennett at the very top, still qualifying for the big events and a good run recently at the UK Open. But you can see that over time, his action has sort of broken down and he sort of kicks his leg out a bit, which can be really highlighted here from this side shot. And with that in mind, you do have to be quite cautious about how close you stand to him, but also it's visually not very good on the eye and when you see that and you see that sort of jerky action you've got to make sure you're not watching you've got to keep very in your zone and keep your head down when you're playing against Richie Burnett because you can really get drawn into seeing things imagine like when you're watching players snatch it makes you feel snatchy 
It's one of those sort of sensory things. You're seeing it with your eyes. It's the same sort of thing as when you see people that are really struggling with dartitis. It makes you feel uncomfortable and uneasy and certainly makes you sort of... You can't watch it when you're playing against somebody who's suffering like that. And it's the same with Richie Burnett. You've really got to keep your head completely down. Find a spot on the floor to really focus on. Really, really tricky customer to play. Dirk Van Dijvenboda has possibly the worst taste in music. He's a quality dart player. But one thing he doesn't do, guys, is he's not a stinker. He's not a smelly one. If that's what you were thinking from the thumbnail, I'm sorry to disappoint you. If you would like to see that video, though, of the most smelly dart players, I'm not going to make it. I'm, I'm not. But... I tell you what, if I get to 100,000 subscribers, if I get that YouTube play button, I will make that video because at that point I won't care anymore. But the reason why Dirk has that sort of smell on the thumbnail is because for a period of time, I'm not sure if he still does this now, so don't quote me on that this is an ongoing thing, but for a period of time he was really struggling with muscle pain. Uh, so I believe it was around the elbow. And what he would do is he'd use a substance called deep heat. If you're not familiar with what deep heat is, it is a for muscle aches and pains, but it leaves a really bad sort of odour, almost like a stingy when you use too much of it. You use it in football quite a lot. Well, and, the, and the cool spray so if you've been around it you'll know exactly what I mean and when I talk about like the sensory side of things that is what you'd get when you play dirt a very strong sense of smell around that deep heat and it's something that you're not familiar or used to or playing around other people and when your senses are doing different things you can be distracted in different ways you can be distracted by sound you can be distracted by sight or you can be distracted by smell there are the three things and I think that's what we can kind of see with these sort of examples I've shown you here why these players I've listed are tricky to play because they affect that sensory process as a non-contact sport we're not going to get that sensory process of touch it's all going to be on those three and yeah sorry Dirk but I, I put you in that one he's not smelly though he's, he's not smelly I will put that one out there right away but yeah, I will. I'll make that video. 100,000 subscribers, though. So if you're not subscribed and you want to see that video, make sure you go down below and press that subscribe button. Because when I hit that YouTube play button, I won't care no more. I'll tell you it all. We'll get it all out in the open. Hope you have enjoyed this video, though, guys. If you have, please do hit a like on it. I'll be sharing more about my experience as a professional player for 11 years right here on Edgar TV. Edgar TV.